Hey guys, this is John, and I'm back with another Student Spotlight segment. This is a series where I highlight games that my students have played that are particularly interesting or instructive. And today we have a game from Grant Owen, who's one of my students from Georgia, the state of Georgia, not the country. And he's a USCF expert. You can see his USCF rating right here, 2073. And he alerted me to this game the other day that he played that, simply put, is absolutely one of the craziest games I've ever seen. And the sequence that we're going to look at uh, is beautiful, complex, it's got everything. Uh, so I wanted to share it with you guys. So we pick up the game right on move 29. It is white to move. So Grant's opponent is David Mbonu. Hope I'm pronouncing that right, 1981. And if we assess the material in this position, white is down a little bit, white is down the exchange. So a rook versus a minor piece. But in return, white has this advanced pawn on d7 that is clearly causing black some grief. And also the knight on e5 and the queen on a2 are coordinating nicely. Uh, you can see that knight f7 check ideas might be in the air. So we pick it up with white playing bishop takes b7. And Grant responding with rook takes bishop. There were other moves possible here already at the beginning. Bishop h5 could be played, but Grant decides to play the most principled move. Rook takes bishop, knight f7 check. And the issue here for black is that this knight cannot be captured. Uh, if rook takes f7, you can pause your recording if you want and try to figure out how white should play. Okay, the answer is queen takes f7. This move completely wins for white. If, for instance, queen takes queen, white can check, promote, black blocks, and now the killer move rook e8. And black can give a useless check on b1, white will escape to g2, but uh, black is just getting mated down here, or losing his queen and then shortly getting mated. So after knight f7 check, this knight is untouchable. So Grant responded with the only move, king to g8, and now d8 queen. And Grant made an interesting comment here. He said, for some reason, I completely missed this move. He assumed that white had to take a perpetual with knight h6 check, which would be a double attack on the king king h8, and then knight f7 again. So never fun when you're in a complicated position and your opponent plays a move that you completely did not look at. So d8 equals queen. Uh, here, if black takes on d8, they're going to meet a swift demise. There is knight takes d8 check. And after, say, rook b3 blocking the check, white has rook e8. So again, black is going to be done in by the back rank weakness that they have. So after... White Queens, uh, Grant, much to his chagrin, I assume, uh, found out he cannot take that queen. So he played queen takes f7. However, in return for the material, uh, black does have an extra rook and a bishop. So it's not completely over or anything. Uh, now here, white played rook e8. And this introduces some cross pin ideas. Um, note that black cannot take any e8 now because of queen takes e8 checkmate. Uh, nor can black take white's queen on a2, because that would be met by rook takes f8 checkmate. So therefore, Grant played rook b1 check, more of a deflection move than anything, uh, hoping that white takes on b1 so that black can respond with rook takes e8. And in that case, for instance, uh, queen takes b1, rook takes e8, the white queen would likely move, and black has some chances in this endgame with the rook and the light square bishop against white's extra queen. Unusual position, uh, but maybe the weaknesses around white's king do give black some counterplay. So instead, after rook b1, David Mbonu played king g2, escaping the check. And here, bishop f3 check. Great move. Uh, and in fact, the only way for black to keep this going, bishop f3 check. Uh, now, the main point of this move is that if white takes on f3, so king takes f3, black has rook b3 check. And you can see that if uh, the white king were to retreat, let's say back to g2, then rook takes e8, and suddenly black is doing excellently. This queen is under attack, and now black has two rooks for the queen. So it's going to be queen and two rooks versus two queens. There's a lot of strange material imbalances that are possible in this one. So bishop f3 check is a, a nice device to force white to make a decision with their king, and... And Bonu correctly plays king h3, so escaping with the king. 
Um, oh yeah, in the case of king takes f3, rook b3, I think relatively best for white would be queen takes b3. And then after, say, pawn takes b3, rook takes f8 check, queen takes f8, queen d5 check, trying to fork the king and the pawn. Black would want to respond with queen f7, defending. And then check here, and we're looking at a draw. I think it would be too dangerous for white to play on, because if there was a trade of queens, white would be unable to catch black's b-pawn. So a draw would have resulted had white captured on f3. Uh, but instead, Mbonu, much to his credit, decides to play for a win, king h3. And here, bishop g4 check, inviting white to go back, king g2. Uh, but instead, white presses on, king h4. So white is already going to great lengths to try to win with the extra material, and who can blame them, really? I mean, you've got two queens in the position. Um, this queen on a2 is still untouchable because of the threat of rook takes f8. Likewise, the rook on e8 is still untouchable. Rook takes e8 is met by queen takes e8. So white's just thinking like, okay, I'm going to ride out these series of checks and this counterplay that black's going to throw at me, and then I must be winning after that. Uh, but here, Grant plays rook b3, which turns out to be the only move. Black must do something about this pressure along the a2 g8 diagonal. They must block this queen on a2, which has been creating lots of issues. So rook b3. Now here, uh, white had a choice to go into a technical endgame. So they could play, if they wanted, uh, rook takes f8, queen takes f8. And now in the game, white played queen d5, but probably they should have just played queen takes f8 and traded down. And after king takes f8, uh, Grant commented that he thought this would be a technical win for white, and I agree. Uh, so long as white's king doesn't come to grief here on the h4 square, white should be able to win this. Um, I looked at queen c2, trying to take care, protect squares like b2 and b1, so the rook can't penetrate further into the position and maybe attack uh, the pawns on the second rank, or maybe go rook b1 to h1. And white should be able to carefully round up this a pawn and win. Uh, but after queen takes f8, Mbono decides to retain his extra queen. So he plays queen d5. Queen d5 check. Now black responds with king h8. White plays queen a to d2. So here the uh, forcing nature of the play has slackened a little bit. And white just decides to centralize one of their queens. Now if you want to pause your video here, uh, try to come up with something for black. So it is... Black to move. Uh, one of the reasons white played queen a to d2 is so that if queen f6 check, black can, uh, white can block with the queen on g5. But try to find a move for black that will give him counterplay. All right, so in this position, Grant played h6. Excellent little move. So not only does this create an escape hatch for the king, it can come up to h7, it introduces the threat of g5 check. And that threat is a significant one. If black hits in g5 check, it's either going to be mate, or if the white queen is standing on d2 as it is now, white would have to sacrifice the queen. So black uh, played h6, and white responded with queen e5, pinning the g7 pawn. And here, Grant played king h7, getting out of the pin, and therefore renewing the threat of g5. White, res white responded with queen d7, introducing another pin. And here, rook b5, trying to deflect the white queen. Uh, now, <laughs> that's a pretty cool looking move. You can see that this rook can be captured either way. But whichever queen white takes with on b5, they're getting checkmated in some way. So if queen d takes b5, there's g5 checkmate. And if queen e takes b5, there is queen f6 checkmate. Note that white's queen would no longer be controlling f6. So not often you get to play a move with a piece where your opponent can take it two ways and with both of their queens, mind you. <laughs> First of all, you'd have to have a position with two queens, but uh, I can't quite recall a game where uh, you can just boldly allow a piece to be captured by both your opponent's queens and it works out tactically. And in fact, your opponent just loses if they do that. So rook b5. Uh, now, as it turns out, rook b1 actually would have been much better here for black. And the position is unusual enough that white can't really deal with the threat of rook to h1 and going after this h2 pawn. But given the time control and how complex this position is, I can't really blame either player for uh, their play in this game. 
So rook b5. Uh, now white must address the threat on their queen. So white played queen e to e7, looking for a trade. And g5 check is still impossible. So Grant just traded one of the queens. Queen takes e7. Queen takes e7. And here black played rook e5. This move looks attractive because it's the same device we've seen before. If queen takes e5, there's no pin on the seventh rank, so black would be able to checkmate with g5. However, as it turns out, rook b1 is still good. Uh, I wrote a little synopsis of this move, but it's the same idea as in the previous position. Rook b1, and because of the threat of rook h1 and taking on h2, white is helpless with this poorly positioned king on h4. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, there's no defense to that rook h1 idea. Moreover, this queen can never leave the seventh rank for fear of g5 checkmate. Um, white could even try to push a pawn like f3 or something, but black will just ignore that rook h1. White can take the bishop, but he gets stuck on the column here at the end, checkmate. So uh, rook b1 was decisive, but Grant played rook e5, trying to attack the queen and deflect it. White played queen a7 in reply. And now here, rook e2. Uh, this time, rook e1 is not quite winning. And if you want to try to find white's defensive resource, you can do that. So after rook e1, if that were to be played, how could white play? Okay, so here, white can save the game by playing f4, rook h1, and queen f2. So defending the h2 square, and this pawn on f4 also stops g5. So that's a very convenient uh, defensive motif, playing f4 in this position. Previously, if we go back a little bit, so right in this position, rook b1, here f4 would not have worked because after rook h1, white cannot bring the queen back to a position where it will defend the h2 pawn. Whereas in the game continuation, after rook e5, queen a7, uh, now that queen can come back to f2. It no longer has to rely on coming back to e2 to defend h2. So uh, instead, Grant played rook e2. And yeah, even here we have an unusual situation. White has to be careful still. As you can see, f3 would just lose on the spot to rook takes h2. And, and Bonu decided to play h3, therefore. So attacking the bishop. g5 is still not possible. Grant played in this position. Actually, maybe I'll ask you to figure it out. If you want to try to predict what black played here, you can pause your video now. Okay, so the way to keep this going for black is rook takes f2. Black is undeterred. So if h takes g4 now, rook h2 will be checkmate, that familiar h file checkmate that we've been looking at. And if queen takes f2, there's g5 checkmate. So what does white do here? This will be the final question of the video. White to play and draw. Okay, white played a waiting move first, queen d7. There's nothing forcing quite yet. Uh, even though I said white to play and draw, I kind of tricked you a little bit. But white just has to wait along this, the seventh rank for now. And then after black plays a move like this, for instance, trying to deflect the queen, we're going to wait once again. And as soon as rook h2 is played, here's where white has to spring into action. And I hope you saw the resource. It is queen takes g7. Beautiful move. So black is on the verge of checkmating white by rook takes h3. So white must leap into action now. And queen takes g7, just an absolutely gorgeous stalemate resource. And the game was agreed drawn because after king takes g7, uh, white is stalemated. There's no legal moves. Uh, the h pawn is pinned, so white cannot legally play h takes g4. Moreover, there's no legal king moves. So there were a lot of twists and turns to this one. I think it's very fitting that the game ended in a draw. I'm just going to quickly go back and recap because I know we went through a couple different sub variations. But basically it started with bishop takes b7, rook takes b7, knight check, king over to g8. Again, black was unable to take that knight. Queen. And now queen takes f7, rook e8, rook b1 trying to deflect white's queen. White decided not to do that. And 
the the complexities really kick off with bishop f3. Like this is when it starts getting pretty weird. <laughs> um, king takes f3 was a draw, so white played that move. Check again, king h4, rook b3. The only saving resource for black, black has to deal with the threat of rook takes f8. So they must block the white queen. And after the exchange on f8, uh, white should take again on f8 and enter that queen versus rook and bishop ending. But this is favorable to the game continuation because white's not in as much danger with their king. And I think with careful play, white could win this. Uh, but as we saw, white played queen d5, and suddenly the game was hanging in the balance. And in fact, it looked for a little while like black was going to win, just based on white's king being on h4. So despite white's slight material superiority, uh, white was the one having to come up with some very accurate defenses, which white accomplished uh, by pinning that black g-pawn and preventing queen f6. But it was still very dicey. And even here, uh, black had some wins with rook b1. So this rook b1 idea, if Grant had noticed it a little sooner, he probably would have won. Uh, just remarkable how helpless white is here, really. I mean, it's, it's a pretty amazing position. The queen on f8 holds g7. Uh, White's queens are basically stuck because they need to deal with those twin threats, queen f6 and g5. And White's king can't help itself, and pushing the pawns does nothing. doesn't help against rook h1. So instead, <laughs> Black played that attractive yet uh, suboptimal move, rook b5. And eventually, after some adventures here again, rook b1 was still winning. But after some adventures involving queen deflections and uh, attacks on the second rank, the game was drawn, thanks to a picturesque stalemate at the end. So nice example, and thank you to Grant for sending this one to me, really appreciate that, and also to his opponent uh, for playing a beautiful game. Uh, I'm going to post the PGN if you want to take a look at this on your own time, because like I said, there are some complicated variations and sub-variations, and I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, so stay tuned for future student spotlights. Thanks for watching, guys.